We Americans believe in free speech. We believe in the First Amendment, in freedom of religion, in freedom of assembly. But is belief and faith really the right attitude to have toward the Constitution? Marianne Franks teaches the Constitution as a scholar and law professor at the University of Miami. She has written a book called The Cult of the Constitution, Our Deadly Devotion to Guns and Free Speech, where she shows that the First and Second Amendments should not be articles of faith, but laws that should be interpreted actively, creatively, and intelligently to serve everyone in our society. Professor Franks has also drafted the first model criminal statute on non-consensual pornography, which is sometimes referred to as revenge porn. So she's worked in the middle of the field of how to regulate, for example, what gets published on the internet, what should remain private, what should be protected, and what everybody can get access to. She holds degrees from Harvard Law School and Oxford University and is a frequent media commentator, a scholar, a teacher, and the author of the book, The Cult of the Constitution. Willkommen, bienvenue, welcome. No, this is not cabaret, it's Think About It, a podcast about the power of ideas and how language can change the world, with Uli Baer. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to have Professor Marianne Franks of the University of Miami Law School here today. Thank you, Marianne, first of all, for coming on the program today. Thank you so much for having me. It's really exciting to speak to you. You've written a huge amount and you've worked in legislation and in jurisprudence you have a JD from Harvard and a doctorate in literature, actually, in philosophy from Oxford University. So you're a very text-based scholar, and then you're teaching First and Second Amendment. And you've just published this book, The Cult of the Constitution. And I was interested, when you start your classes, you're trying to convey to your students a certain kind of appreciation and even, let's say, respect for these fundamental texts, right? Right. I think that's right. I think it's no accident that I've spent so much of my life studying texts, as you say, whether that's you know religious texts or whether that's literary texts or whether it's legal texts. What I want my students to think about above all else is what the text actually means on its own um, before we start the process of criticism or we pro start the process of reception or history or manipulation, that they understand that the text has its own kind of integrity that's really important to begin with. Mm -hmm. And this is why you teach a class on the First Amendment, Second Amendment, that these texts, of course, while they have their own integrity, they don't exist without the work of interpretation and reading. That's exactly right. They're dead letters, but they have a status of something much more powerful than that. I think that's right. And I think the challenging thing about teaching law, which is different from teaching philosophy, which I've also done, or teaching literature, which I've also done, is to get students, to get people to see things like the First Amendment and the Second Amendment, the Constitution generally, as a text. Because I think very much, especially for Americans at least, it's not a text. They think of it almost as being something spiritual, as something that they can kind of intuitively understand instead of having to study and to take apart and to see in context. And so Really, I think the most challenging thing at the beginning of these classes is to kind of alienate the students from the text because there's a kind of familiarity that comes with the Constitution and especially those first two amendments that makes it difficult to turn that text into an object of study. So a lot of what we do at the very beginning is holding up that, you know, the actual words of these amendments and getting them to look at them almost as if for the first time. You've made this analogy in your book. You said you grew up in a fundamentalist, really strongly text-based community where there's the similar relationship that these texts, they give us an identity, they create belief, they are something groups of people are committed to, and while we know maybe all the words by heart, they're not meant to be reread and reinterpreted against the larger idea of what the group takes from them. That's very much the familiarity that I was speaking to, is that that same sense of 
religious familiarity that people have, so many people have, with the Bible. Like the Constitution, it slips past your critical faculties because it's become so much a part of your childhood or your own history or your own sense of identity that you stop thinking of it as a text. You stop thinking of it as something that someone created in a certain context that has been interpreted and applied in all these ways. And so that was very much the heart of this project in this book was thinking about their similarities because it struck me as so much the same kind of complicated and fraught relationship that people have with religious texts and legal texts together. But the irony is that they don't understand how fraught that relationship is. It feels natural. It feels completely intuitive as if they don't need any explanation. We just know what it means by reading it. And it gives people a certain security or certainty that say, I believe in the First Amendment. I believe in the Second Amendment. I hear this all the time. I believe in the First Amendment. And right. You are a legal professor, law professor, I said, it's not a matter of believing in it, right? <laughs> yes, <laughs> right. There's something arrestingly anti-intellectual, right, about that statement, I believe in it, or this is what the First Amendment means. It's that sense of not just righteousness, although that is a part of it, and that is part of what makes it so difficult to talk about critically, but also that certainty that there's something obvious about it. You know, of course, I believe in the First Amendment like an article of faith, but people don't hear themselves because really they've given away more than they, they know. It really is an article of faith. It becomes a kind of mantra that people say. And even when someone is about to say something critical or nuanced about the First Amendment or about free speech, they almost always seem to think that they need to preface it by saying, well, you know, I'm all for free speech or I'm, a, you know, I respect the First Amendment, which is a very strange thing because you're already giving it away that you think that that means a certain set of presumptions and a certain non-critical attitude, a certain unreflected acceptance. And so it's very telling, I think, how people speak about the First Amendment. When people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I really believe in free speech, but it's they're also, I think, very worried that they are leaving a community that to say, this is not American. I hear this quite a lot. I'm an American citizen. I'm quite proud of it, but yes. I have an accent, so people call me out right away and say, oh, well, you don't understand. For us, this yes. is very different. And I said, well, actually, I'm as much a citizen of this country as other people. And you put this kind of unquestioning belief in a really dynamic relationship to the 14th Amendment. And you say the First Amendment is held on to that and say, I believe in free speech. People don't usually come up with the 14th Amendment first and say, I really <laughs> believe in the 14th Amendment and equality, yes. and that's my base principle, right? <laughs> right, and that is what I think is so, well, it's one of the many things that I think is so interesting and also tragic about our attachment to the Constitution. And again, echoing our attachment to religious texts is how selective it is, because People are most certain about their fidelity to a text when they're reading it the most selectively. So people don't really want to think about, well, what is the keystone here? Or what is the overall message of this document? They pick out the parts that, they, that speak to them, that verify what they already want to believe. And they hold on to those. And anyone who sounds as though they are deviating from that interpretation or deviating from that relationship Exactly as you say, there's sort of a policing of, of who then belongs. If you say something that does not fit, right, then it's quite literally heretical, right? So you start to introduce some sort of idea or some sort of critical position towards the text, and suddenly people look at you askance as if you don't quite belong here or you don't deserve the belonging or the identity, right? So again, that very highly religious sensibility that people have, not just with regard to religion, of course, but also with regard to the Constitution. And what you lay out for both the First and the Second Amendment, and then in your other work on cyberbullying, on online harassment, on kind of non-consensual publication of intimate images, the work you've done there, you say this belief, this unquestioning belief, benefits certain groups at the expense of others. And it's not that we all believe in free speech, so we're mm -hmm. all going to put up with harassment and bad speech and hate speech, or we all believe in the Second Amendment, so there's terrible things that happen. It's this quote you use quite a few times, this is the price we have to pay for our own freedom. And you're saying that skews something here which has been the reality for 200 years in this country. It really does, and it matters quite a bit who's saying this, right? So one of the more obvious points is that the people who tend to be loudest about insisting that this is just the price we have to pay and the insistence of using that kind of universalizing we are the people who don't really suffer the consequences of whatever it is that we're talking about. So you will hear people say, you know, I, of course, I feel the suffering of those who are harassed or targeted or threatened or whatever the case may be. But, you know, you know, we just all have to be very forgiving of this because that, you know, as hard as that is, we all have to accept it. And 
you really do need to, I think, ask yourself, well, who is this who is saying that we all just need to accept this? Is this someone for whom the kind of consequences of really awful forms of speech is really kind of an abstraction? I mean, they know about it, they know it happens, but it's not really something they suffer themselves. It's awfully easy and convenient for someone in that position to say, well, you'll just have to put up with this. And it, it very much echoes, I think, what we see in terms of policies, in terms of you know everything from tax policy to welfare policies, right? When people will say these things about how, you know, well, obviously there's some negative impact here, but we just have to deal with it because that is for the greater good. And it just so often tends to be that the people who are most invested in that vision are the people who are exploiting everybody else. So they are the ones who get to escape those negative consequences and get to reap all the benefits of that system. Although sometimes that expression also comes from people who do, in fact, suffer. When we think about the Jewish members of the ACLU who have taken up the causes of neo-Nazis, I mean, it's quite clear in those situations that there is a very real and sincere conviction there. And I do think it's important to distinguish those two. I think there's something very different about a person who has been able to live without the burdens of really harmful speech and making that kind of claim versus someone who truly does sacrifice in order to defend what they see as this principle that they have to defend. But even there, as I say in the book and elsewhere, you know, we really still have to look not at just personal situations. It's no one's personal life that actually matters. It's the overall balance of what's happening. And the overall balance of what's happening is that, yes, there is an elitist class for speech, just like there is for anything else. And those people are essentially capitalizing on the harm that is done to other people, right? It's not going to touch them for the most part, and they're going to get to reap the benefits of it. And for those people who really do stick to their principles and sacrifice themselves, they are acting in a very principled way, but it doesn't necessarily make their position the correct one. And then, of course, it's very case-specific, but when I use the expression for the title of my book, The Cult of the Constitution, that's very deliberate because I think the really important thing to remember about cults is that they're never just evenly distributed goods or consequences in a cult. There's always one class that is not maybe necessarily fully committed to the things that the cult supports. Maybe they are, maybe they aren't. There could be a cynical aspect to it. There could be just a kind of self-interested aspect, but there's always a leadership group right? That is always, for some reason, the ones who get better care, who get better resources, who get better attentions, and they tell everyone else that they need to suffer and that sacrifice is a beautiful thing. So I think we see that replicating itself very much within the constitutional system too. And when you say that there's a benefit to people who are already in privileged positions, kind of an elitism to the way free speech or Second Amendment is used and say everybody else, just you have to put up with it the way we do as well. I think that for some people it's really unsettling to hear that because they say, no, 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 the Constitution was framed, the founders meant to create an egalitarian document. They may grant you the space and say, well, yes, the 14th Amendment corrects a lot of things. The Reconstruction <laughs> Amendments actually make the Constitution complete. But now that's also our tool. And so this idea that it's a group of people that actually has benefited more than other people is anathema to what the Constitution is supposed to do. So can you unpack this a bit to say, it's, mm. is it people really in charge who say we are an interpret the Constitution for our own benefit? Or do they have this sincere belief, well, this is the best way we can do it and everybody else will benefit as well? Oh, it would be so much more simple <laughs> if they just came out and said it, right? That To say that when we say we believe in free speech, we just mean it for people like us. The way that, that ideology works, the way that propaganda works, is that you can't come out and say it, right? You have to disavow it as you're doing it. And we see this right now, of course, horrifically enacted by the current administration. But the sense of engaging in cruelty and exploitation and then denying that you're doing it, that is the very essence, right, of propaganda and ideology. And it is telling to think that we often, exactly as you say, think about the founding fathers and the grand moments in which we entered this compact And then if you do actually look at that, then you see this is exactly what we're talking about. This was the most incredibly privileged group of elites who were saying, we the people, who were saying things as if they were applying universally. But we know that as a material fact, they were denying these kinds of rights and privileges at that moment. So it isn't something that happened by accident. So what's quite sinister in some ways, maybe that's not the right word, but it is a very sort of calculated exploitation of people's ideas. People want fairness. They want to hear that what they are participating in is a fair system. And so you have to tell them that that's what's happening, even if everything around you tells you that that's not true. 
And we have not actually shaken that as a country. People get very offended when you remind, it's almost as though it's more rude to point out that, you know, the founding fathers were essentially self-interested and essentially trying to hang on to their own privileges and tried to exclude, or rather to continue to perpetuate exactly the forms of exploitation that they complained of the British, right? And to do the exact same things to slaves, obviously, and also to women in another extent. It's almost as though that's the impolite thing is to point out that that's what they did, as opposed to really confront what that means to say that this founding document and the reverence that we have for these people in that time were deeply flawed in that very sense, and that that creates a kind of responsibility and a burden for us. So I think that's the reason why the Constitution has that kind of power on us is because it tells us that we're all being treated fairly. It tells us the things we want to hear about ourselves, that we are, in fact, enlightened and principled and care about the greater good, when, in fact, you know, throughout history, we know that that's not true in the way that the Constitution is invoked and applied and articulated doesn't mean any of those things at all. But that's very hard for any of us, no matter where we are in this hierarchy. And it is a hierarchy. No matter where we are in it, we try to tell ourselves we are supposed to be here. And that is the entire purpose of a cult. It's the entire purpose of a narrative that is grand in that sense, is to reassure everyone in it. Your place where you are, whether it's at the top or at the bottom, is where you need to be. So are you saying that the Constitution kind of normalizes inequality in a way, that people say, well, there's this text that governs all of us, it's the best we could come up with, they tried so hard, you are addressed by it, I'm addressed by it, we all constituted in it, and the fact that things are a bit tougher for some groups, that's just sort of the kinks we have to work out over history toward the more perfect union. But it normalizes it in a way to say, we're all holding on to this one idea, this belief in the Constitution, and the fact that some people it's a bit harder for them than for other people. That's just the way it is. But this naturalizes conditions that you're saying, then there's nothing natural about one group taking power over another group. Right. There is nothing natural about it. And the process of myth-making around the Constitution, it keeps covering that over, right? It keeps sort of giving lip service to the idea that, yes, of course, we understand that it's imperfect and those men were not you know, perfect and they had these flaws. And then you're done with it, as if that kind of casual, breezy sort of assessment is enough, when in fact it's actually a very big deal to say that no, in fact, the people to whom we ascribe all of these noble intentions were not. Actually, it is like attacking idols. It's like attacking somebody's god, right? So what does it mean then? Well, it's partly, yes, there's a narrative that says we're working it out, right? We're sort of working out the kinks towards perfection. Progress is slow. Think about how much progress we've made since 200 years and, and all those th types of things. And, but there's also, though, I think, a very serious kind of psychological effect that says if we keep insisting that people are equal, if we're insisting that people should have all the rights and privileges that everyone you know, has equally, and then for some reason you don't, for some reason you're at the bottom, for some reason you're suffering, for some reason you're vulnerable, then the only thing that narrative leaves you with is the sense in which you have done something wrong. There must be something that's off about you or your position or your identity, and that's the cause, not the structure, not the system, not the constitution, you are the problem. And that's what I think is the very insidious way in which propaganda around the constitution and around this country's identity really works at people and convinces them that to the extent that you are not on top, it's because you didn't work hard enough or because you didn't have the same merit as everybody else. Because what else could possibly be the explanation? That's actually really insightful to say it sets up people that they actually believe in their own condition as saying it's my own fault in a way. I didn't really do enough to be a real truly deserving American maybe. Right. And I want to get to an example that you talk about quite a lot in your work. So the experience of women online You've said in a lot of articles, which I found really powerful, that there's a huge drop-off of women participating in Internet or online conversations because of harassment. Then there's two arguments. They say, well, harassment is hard to regulate. God forbid we regulate it because I know our own speech would be regulated the next day, et cetera, et cetera. It's a slippery slope. And they're also being told in a way, just toughen up. Everybody mm -hmm. gets subjected to it. Mm -hmm. Everybody has. So they use even these words like, oh, it's egalitarian, everybody mm -hmm. gets harassed, you're in an equal position. And you're saying, no, you can show empirically that women are driven out of these conversations because they are targeted in different ways. And what you just said about the psychological effects, then women are also told, you're too sensitive. Mm -hmm. Just put up with it. 
if you bucked up and you were a real constitutionally defending American woman, you would just take <gasps> it all. Yes, so the psychological right. impact is actually reduced in saying the fact that you experience anything is a sign of your own weakness rather than yes. a moment of protest and say this is an unequal condition. Yes, that is in so many ways what constitutes our political identity, it constitutes our social identities, the sense of what happens when you are faced with vulnerability. What happens when you're faced with someone who feels excluded or hurt or silenced? Do we say, oh, that's a great injustice and it needs to be corrected? Or do we say, well, clearly the problem is with you? And who gets which answer is, is pretty revealing, right? Although at this point in our history, not particularly surprising. Because this is the fascinating thing about the shift, I think, in at least our political landscape, that it used to be the case that at least Republicans would pretend that injuries didn't exist. A lot of the rhetoric was, well, we're just all very tough. And everybody else who complains, you know, whether because of their race or because of their gender or because of their class status, it's because they're just not working hard enough. They're just not equal in the sense of they don't want to be equal. There's always some personal reason why they're just not getting what they should be getting. But then it's hard to know exactly where to market, but at least in the last 20 or so years, you see a real shift in conservative politics to say there's injury everywhere. Conservative, especially white, especially men, are injured just by virtue of being criticized. And that's an extraordinary thing because it tells you that this whole time it's been kind of a game, right? That, of course, conservatives know that injury exists, that it's real. They certainly feel it when it happens to them. And instead of that creating a kind of empathetic moment to think, well, if I, as a person who does not have to suffer from racism or sexism or class bias, if I am still struggling, if there are still things that are difficult for me and cause me pain, how much worse is it for someone who has, on top of the kinds of experiences all of us have as human beings, also has to contend with racist attitudes or sexist attitudes. And for some reason, that moment of empathy and enlightenment just does not happen. And there's a doubling down of, well, of course there's injury, but only when it happens to me. So when you see the same things being played out online, it's really very much that. It's not as though there's one group of people saying, everything online is just rough and tumble, you have to deal with it. Because these are the same people who will tell women exactly all the things that you just said, who will complain if someone makes fun of them online, who will complain if there's a political account that actually mocks them. So you have at the same time this extraordinary self-sensitivity and this callousness towards everyone else. And that's what I don't understand on a very fundamental level that people can't see. Because it isn't as though we've got one group trying to be tough and everybody else is just being too weak. It's a question of what you consider to be tough and what you consider to be vulnerability. Everybody thinks that they're vulnerable. Everyone does. Everyone complains about things that happens to them. The critical moment of that should be, okay, how much does your sense of subjective vulnerability actually line up with objective factors? And it's that critical question that isn't happening so that you get people saying that the worst thing that's possibly happening right now is that conservatives are being silenced on Twitter. As if that were possible, first of all, but, but also as if that would matter. And because you imagine if it's women or people of color who make the same kind of claims about how they don't feel comfortable on certain platforms, the answer is toughen up. But as soon as it becomes for the class of people who live their lives and move throughout the world without anyone ever making them uncomfortable, suddenly do feel uncomfortable, well, then all of a sudden we have to take that very seriously and everything needs to halt. So there's that very, very self-serving double standard there. But yes, it's that critical moment, right? Because if you just ask people, do you feel threatened or do you feel victimized? That's a useless question. And every time I see one of these Pew surveys or whatever it is that asks people, right. do you feel as though you're being harassed online? I think that's a very dumb, dumb question, right? We need right. to be much more careful about what we're asking people because you'll get, you know, not shockingly, these surveys will show that men are harassed more often online. And you drill down a little bit and you realize the men are saying things like, well, people call me a jerk for my beliefs, you know, which, okay, you know, I personally don't think that that's a useful definition of harassment. That's not harassment. That is actually the rough and tumble of being online and having people not necessarily agree with you. We should all be able to suck that up. But if you actually ask questions like, has someone threatened your safety? Has someone threatened you with sexual assault? Has someone actually tried to contact your employer and tried to get you fired? Is someone releasing naked photos of you so that you will get fired from your job or lose educational opportunities? There are real substantive questions that we should be asking. And when we start to differentiate according to whether or not someone's calling you names versus someone is threatening you with rape and death, then you see, yeah, women are having a very different experience online than men are. Added to which, you know, even when it's physical threats being proportionately distributed to men and women, 
women have much more reason to think that that's actually going to happen to them because of women's vulnerability, generally speaking, because of their victimization, generally speaking, when someone threatens to rape them, there isn't the same sense in which a woman can shrug that off than a man might be able to shrug off some sort of macho posturing online in the same way that they might, you know, encounter that in a bar. So we really should be spending so much more time asking not the subjective questions, how do you feel online, but actually asking, okay, what are the material kinds of abuse or harassment that you're facing online? And is that substantially different from people of other groups? And you work in this area where you've introduced bills or tried to create legislation to say it should not be possible to release non-consensual images, as you said, naked photographs, et cetera, because it is a form of harassment. It has real impact in the world. It affects you professionally, privately, et cetera. And I think the argument you're making, if that's right, is you're saying to regulate that would improve speech, would create better conditions, more equal conditions. It would make the Internet more fair. And weirdly enough, the blowback is an, oh, you're trying to censor things. And secondly, what you call victim claiming. The real targets are you know, the Alex Joneses, the conspiracy theorists, the white men who are so fragile now and under such attack. So there are these two parts that the response is, first of all, oh, well, that would be censorship. Yep. And the other one is, wow, then people couldn't speak anymore, and that would be white men. Right. So it's this double sort of movement that's happening right now, which I think is really hard to disentangle because, as you said earlier in the conversation, people are so quick to say, well, I defend the First Amendment. Everything yes, else is everybody censorship. Does. Yeah. <laughs> and everybody's view of what that means, right. you know, it's very clear to them, right? right? And then the fun conversation to have, this is the reason why online conversations don't go as well, but in person you can ask, and in classrooms that you can ask, a good teacher will ask, okay, so when you say that, what do you mean? Do you mean you consider the prohibition against child pornography to be censorship? And the first thing you'll see is that people will freak out and say, well, no, obviously, you know, we should ban child pornography and that's censorship. But of course, it's literally censorship, right? That's probably the clearest example that we have of actual censorship. But no one really wants to say, well, you know, I, I want to think twice about the child pornography prohibition because I believe in actual free speech. So that's, you know, example number one to show that people's skepticism, let's say, about what is free speech and what is censorship is very self-interested and highly motivated. So what does it mean when we call something censorship? This has become, in my view, one of the most overused words. It's threatening to lose all of its meaning, I think, at this point, because it has been deployed in the sense of every time someone doesn't fully promote what I say right. or listen to what I'm saying, that's censorship. You know, because I do care about the text and I do care about words meaning something, that alarms me to see how incredibly flexible that word has become. Now, I think it's fair for us to say that censorship does not have to be narrowly defined as only what the government does to punish us. But I think we should probably start there because that is really the, the heart of what censorship is. Censorship, I think, is not a useful concept if we deploy it to mean you refuse to carry my ideas. If this is a private platform, for instance, no one is obligated to carry your ideas. No more than if you wanted to stand up in the middle of a restaurant and launch into a racist screed, that restaurant owner has every right to kick you out, and it's not censorship when they do. So the strange thing about the internet is that it's also made us believe that everything is speech and everything is censorship. It's not just an intellectual point, it's constitutive of the way that we talk to each other now, because Again, it's rewarding people who complain about censorship. It's investing them with the kind of mantle of the First Amendment, and that's very troubling. So, yes, I mean, the sense that that's censorship as opposed to just, no, that's treating this kind of behavior the same way we would treat something similar. So everybody, at some level, appreciates privacy legislation, if they can think of it that way. They don't want it to be true that the last visit they had to the doctor could be written up and posted on Facebook. Nobody wants that. No one believes that when they hand their credit card to a waiter in a restaurant that that waiter is allowed to use that credit card any way he sees fit. People know this. The question is then why won't you apply the same principles to a different kind of information, but arguably even more intimate, for instance, naked photos? And the answer is something along the lines of, because I don't care about that as much. I mean, this is the response of people who call that free speech are essentially saying, I don't care about the harm. I only care about my own interests here. And it's so obvious that you think that people could see it, but they really often don't. I'll ask you to stay right there. This is really interesting. So I wouldn't want my personal medical information to be released, although some doctor could say that's my free speech right. You gave it to me yes. and you signed some waiver or something. 
I don't want any of my personal information. There's lots of things I don't want disclosed. There are many other examples, as you said, in the law, when the government says you cannot write on a food product that this contains aspirin when it contains heroin. None mm -hmm. of us would agree that's a free speech issue. Although if I want to sell you a bottle of water and it really contains something poisonous and I want to say it's really good for you, that could be a speech claim and you say not at all. It's completely not even entered into this debate. But what you just said, people want to defend this idea because they don't care about the harm. I talked to Richard Delgado a couple of months ago, who's one of these people who's been in this debate for 50 years <laughs> almost, and he <laughs> said a second benefit is that it maintains the status quo. It's not mm -hmm. just that I don't care about the harm it creates, but it creates the way that minorities, people of color, women, are intimidated enough that this could happen, that I'm going to protect it because it structures yes. this form of discourse. And the internet is not the only one, but generally. So there's an investment mm -hmm. in the status quo. It's not just, I don't hear you or it's so difficult, it's too bad for you, but actually, I benefit from it. Right. As a white man, some people are really at risk of being harassed in this way, and other people are not. Mm -hmm. The question, why wouldn't we all as Americans say, well, this is wrong to have this investment and set it up. It's either free speech or censorship, and some people will be targeted and other people won't, and some groups benefit and other people get harmed. Mm -hmm. This would be the opening of a constitutional conversation, right? Yes, it should be, and I think, I think Delgado's point is exactly right, and it's been articulated by definitely the critical race theorists. People like Duncan Kennedy, I still remember an essay that he wrote back in, I think, the 1990s called Sexy Dressing, which is, it remains one of my very favorite pieces of writing. And he talks about this, I think the term he uses is the tolerated residuum of violence against women. And the analogy here is that it's not necessarily that every man wants to do harm to women, that, that, that they are, themselves could ever sexually assault someone or would want to engage in those kinds of behaviors, but they all benefit from it, right? Because it changes, as you say, first of all, it perpetuates the status quo, but it also preserves a kind of bargaining aspect that is, as he, if I recall correctly, puts it, you know, every man who's not a rapist gets a kind of benefit from just not being a rapist. And that lowers the bar so much that if we're talking about relationships, or at least heterosexual ones, in terms of kinds of negotiations, well, then wow. the negotiation position for men is just it's boosted by the fact that bad men exist and other men don't do anything about it. And I think that's incredibly powerful and that's incredibly apt for what we're looking at here because it's exactly right to say that some people are merely indifferent to the harms that don't affect them personally. Other people are deeply invested in it because they want to perpetrate those harms. And then there's the people that I think that Delgado is talking about, which is not perpetrating them, but definitely sort of passively benefiting from them. And I think that probably accounts for the majority of the people who find themselves taking refuge in this really reassuring sense that it's not because I don't care about revenge porn, I just care more about the First Amendment. But I think it's really hard to get to this. And I actually, I'm really interested in this conversation. So I'm a white man. And I do think it's real work to realize what I benefit from all the time by just walking into a room or by speaking. And I know in my heart of hearts, you can harass me. I can be subjected. And we all have these experiences these days if we engage in any kind of public work. And I've been called all sorts of horrible things. This is very concrete. What's missing is rape fantasies, of course. I'm a mm -hmm. man, so I should be deported, I should be demoted. I, should, I mean, there are lots of things, and really, it's actually doxing on a really horrible level when you mm -hmm. have a family and all that. It is actually very yes. intimidating. It's very personal information. But at the same time that to do this work, that this belief in the Constitution protects my privilege, I think that's a very hard realization for us, for Americans, that it, it protects unequal conditions when we've been taught from grammar school, no, it actually protects all of us equally. Right. And I think that it's both of those things, exactly as you say. It's one that we've been taught that it protects everybody equally. But the other thing you're articulating is the part that I think is really hard for people to talk about, which is it's almost as though people assume that if you say women have it worse or that people of color have it worse, it's almost as though we're saying, well, white men then don't ever suffer. And you're saying that they don't have any challenges in their lives, which of course is not what's being said. Unfortunately, I think because of the devolution of online discourse, sometimes that is what it sounds like. Like it's a zero sum game to say, well, no, no, it's the marginalized people who suffer and everybody else is fine. Because you will hear, and I'm from Arkansas, this is what I hear a lot, you know, about the struggles of working class white 
men especially, which of course are real. It isn't to say that they're not. And I think that some of the resentment and the fear comes from thinking if they open up that door to saying, oh, this person is suffering more than I am, it means that my suffering doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But of course, it doesn't mean that. It means, I think, to, to think in terms of what Kimberly Crenshaw called intersectionality, the real kind, not just saying, let's throw in a bunch of identities, but the real kind of compound oppressions, right? Again, if you understand what it's like to struggle to feed your family or to be attacked or to have someone threaten your livelihood, that is real. And it is something that we should be talking about because that is a problem. It's only a question of, are you going to assume that that means that anyone else has no claim to victimization? Is it that you're going to be so full of your own sense of victimization that you can't see anybody else's? And that's really the problem, that people think of it as the zero-sum game when it isn't. Yeah, it's very hard to make this connection, what Kimberly Crenshaw calls intersectionality. How do you develop a solidarity when you feel that granting somebody else recognition of their experience diminishes my experience? Mm -hmm that it is this competitive space. You make the distinction between civil rights and civil liberties. The ACLU mm -hmm. wades into this all the time and says, well, at the end of the day, it's tough, but we have to make some choices. And you're saying all these debates keep on reinscribing the inequality rather than opening it up and saying, I'm not competing with you on your experience. You have this experience, I have this experience, but we can find a way maybe to accommodate those experiences and move forward. Yes, there is so much opportunity to do that. I mean, we can think about just take economics, for instance, how many people that I know personally who will blame their situation, let's say the average white working class person will blame their situation somehow on black people or on lesbians, bizarrely enough. And this is something that literally comes up in conversations I have with family members and people from, from Arkansas and, and people from my background who honestly think that the reason why they suffer, the reason why they don't have the life they should have is because of an immigrant or because of some you know, person who's a minority in some sense. They actually think that this is true. It's almost tragic to think of how obvious this is, right? right. How much the ruling class is benefiting. You, know, you don't even have to read Marx to know this, right? To say that the exploitation class is just laughing at this to say, I'm so glad that poor people are turning on each other. I'm so glad that people who are struggling to feed their children are going to turn on the people who are also trying to feed their children and not look at the system that is taking their labor and is exploiting them. So that's a classic example, I think, of you've got on the one hand, you're appealing to the ego identity of those individuals who are holding on to the only thing they have, which is their belief in racial superiority or gender superiority. And then you have that overlord class, which is thinking this is great, right? Class conflict is what keeps us in power, because as long as they're fighting with each other, they're not going to say, there's something wrong with the structures that we're subjecting everyone to, that the ratio between CEO pay and the average worker pay has just become exponentially you know, ridiculous, and it should be ridiculous, and we should all be talking about it. And we're not, because for some reason we become convinced that the people who are more vulnerable than us are the reasons for our oppression. So it's both. It's appeal to the worst instincts in people to make them feel as though they've got some shred of superiority, whatever it is they have left, and make sure that they have conflicts with each other so that they never actually call out the structure in the system that might actually endanger the status quo to begin with. There could be real economic work, empirical work, to show what people are suffering from, that it's wage depreciation, that it's much more difficult to support a family, et cetera. But somehow, you talk in your book a little bit about the campus debates on speech, and that for some reason, the great crisis in our country, when you listen to conservative or reactionary or right-wing radio or television, is that our constitutional rights will be taken away from us, mm -hmm. which is very strange to have a largely <laughs> Republican-dominated government and a conservative Supreme Court. And they're saying, this is the greatest threat to America right now, mm -hmm. that women, minorities, oversensitive students, et cetera, are going to take our rights away. You know, you live in Florida, so the Parkland shooting, and you responded to this, what happened to the students who raised a very sensible question of what kind of life is this to be terrified of a mass shooting? And the response was, you're destroying America and you're destroying the Constitution. I don't think it's a substitute. It's actually sort of linked to it. It's not a diversion tactic to say, let's focus on a free speech controversy at Berkeley or somewhere, mm -hmm. and let's dominate the news for a week with that which may not be the most urgent issue in America. <laughs> but at the same time, your work is saying it is kind of fundamentally linked to maintaining an inequality. Yes, it is fundamental to ensuring that we classify harm in a very specific way and that we make it invisible in other contexts, right? So 
that victim claiming idea that I articulate in the book, I mean, because it does go so much farther than just the victim blaming, right, which is trying to tell people who are suffering that they're responsible for their own suffering. The victim claiming move is you're not suffering, I'm suffering. So when you dominate the media with stories of how, oh, there was a conservative student who didn't feel comfortable saying something, or there was a controversy over a right-wing speaker who wanted to come to Berkeley or what have you. It's not just that you're not listening to the actual things that the average student is suffering. It's also that you are listening to this outsized aggrievement, right? That, that again, if you ask substantively, what is the harm here, really doesn't add up to very much, right? There is no wholesale suppression of conservative ideas. And even if there were, right, in the sense of, oh, I'm uncomfortable in the classroom saying these ideas, you have to wonder what happened to the old conservative response and the response that conservatives still give to every person of color and woman, which is, you know, buck up, right? You know, you need to toughen up and, and get your ideas accepted on the market. If people are mocking you, it's because you're not very good, right? So Again, it just seems so obvious. The, the hypocrisy is so blatant, right? People are saying that they can't eat during the semester when the cafeterias close at colleges because that was their only source of food or because women are actually being sexually assaulted in colleges and they're being punished for speaking out. Those things don't bother a certain group of people. But the moment you hear, well, there was this one speaker and there was some controversy, that's what we're going to so it's that kind of ranging of priorities, I think, that is really so disturbing because what we learn from that is the true harm is in the conservative student who doesn't feel like people like him. That becomes who we sympathize with. Or the guy with 27 guns who says, look, you know, if another Democrat becomes president, then he's going to take away all my guns. That becomes our sense of who's harmed or who is actually suffering. And that makes no sense whatsoever. And then you say in the beginning of the book, sometimes you need to state the obvious. And it's yeah. unfortunate <laughs> that what you're saying, it should be obvious. And when you just said, when you have conversations with family members or friends from Arkansas, where you come from, How do you move in this conversation to say, you can't just sort of bang your head and say, this is so obvious, just look at it. Because but your whole book is about that our investment is deeper than a rational interrogation of these words and these texts and policies. People feel threatened that they're losing part of who they are if they start questioning the system. Yes, and that is a hard conversation to have with people. And there are certain ground rules or certain kinds of conditions that have to exist before you can even have that conversation. And because of the 24-hour news cycle and the 24-hour propaganda that we now live in, it's almost impossible to have those conversations anymore. So I despair most of the time, honestly, about how it is to have these conversations. And part of my reason for writing the book was an attempt to have it, right, to say that in this very old-fashioned way, I'm going to write a book, not a tweet and not a, and not a Facebook post. I'm going to write a book, right, and hope that there's some space in our culture for people to sit and just think for a minute. doesn't mean you have to agree, because this is something I really do see reflected in the classroom all the time. And the longer I think about it, the more I think, if we could make the world more like a classroom, we'd all be better off, right? Because there are things that we just understand when we're in the classroom. I don't have to constantly tell people in the class please don't use racial epithets and don't, don't threaten your partner with rape. Right? I don't have to tell them that. They all know that that is not acceptable behavior and that you couldn't have a conversation, a real conversation, if someone in that room actually feels physically threatened or even for that matter feels as though they're going to be attacked in a way that is extremely vicious verbally. So we understand that there are certain ground rules that you can listen to someone and actually listen to what they say and still disagree with it, but you do want to hear it first. But there, you can see it. It's this impulse that the Internet rewards in us which is to just to shut you down, you know, three seconds in, because if I start to think about it, it's going to make me feel uncomfortable with who I am. And we, as a culture, have just gotten so very scared of the idea of discomfort. We just, we don't, we can't stand it, right? If something bothers us, if something makes us feel not like who we think we are, we just respond with rage and with irritation and with, you know, just sort of a blanket of responses. I don't understand how we got there, because truly the best thing about getting the opportunity to talk to more people, right? What the internet was supposed to do for us, the great things about you know this kind of communication possibility was to actually have conversations instead of thinking about ways to attack each other. And I don't want that to turn into a sense of, well, you know, it's all kind of a cacophony out there. We've all become really uncivil. No, it, there are real differences in the way that people deal with that incivility. But that sense of Can I just talk to you for a second about this? Don't use the word, you know, Republican. Don't use the word Democrat. Can we just say, okay, do you believe that children are responsible for the actions of their parents? Do you believe that if tomorrow a tornado hit your trailer and you had nowhere else to go, but you saw that there was an abandoned 
shack somewhere and you took shelter and do you think that you'd have the right to do that even though that's technically against the law could we just talk about these things without any labels on them and see if there really is a principle that we come up with and then roll back and then go back to some of these really contentious issues and say okay if that's true if we believe that people who are in need are entitled to even sometimes to transgress the law because there's a greater need then let's talk about what that means for immigration let's talk about what that means for incarceration or you know let's talk about what the implications of that principle really might be but it's so hard to get there because people are so, so worried. They're just so worried that you're going to take something away from them that they don't even want to engage in the experiment. And that's a very, very tragic thing. It's interesting when you said you kind of despair because your book is actually, I thought, quite hopeful in a way. I mean, you walk through these controversies, the Internet, guns and speech as these battlegrounds. But yeah. then you say... There is some space to do this work, and the classroom is one. I do think the Internet, there is some room left, right, where people actually are learning, and we're also seeing the morphing of Twitter into something different. It's no longer mm -hmm. just shouting and tweeting, but actually people have threads and are mm -hmm. using it as a teaching tool. So you're saying there is something to be done, especially when you look at the 14th Amendment, that you can mm -hmm. unsink the unquestioning faith and belief, and do something productive. When you let your students get out and you say, you go out forth into the world, become lawyers, attorneys, and, or saviors of humanity, <laughs> what do you give them to send them forth? Oh, dear. Well, it's, it's gotten, in all seriousness, it's gotten harder since 2016. It, it has, because for a couple of reasons, I do think we have experienced a rapid acceleration in, in all the things I think were already going wrong, of course. And I think, and I don't say this so much in the book, but I do think this is true. We talk about the degradation of discourse in America. It really happened with Fox News. It's not an internet phenomenon. The internet is starting to look like Fox News. That's the problem. And so we, we make a real mistake if we think that it's the internet somehow that's creating this. The model was there before, and it's that constant drip drip of propaganda of telling you, you need to be afraid. You need to be angry. You need to be attacking somebody because that's the only way that you will survive. This is what has happened to most of the people that I know who are really trapped in this kind of ideology. It's Fox News that put them there first. And that's what really laid the groundwork. And again, I don't even like saying that because it sounds so partisan, but what I mean is that method, if you turn on anything on Fox and you hear just this constant stream of, you're under attack, you should be afraid, you should be angry, and there's nothing else. There's no exploration there. There's no curiosity. There's no intellectual exchange. There's no doubt. There's no investigation. There's no critical analysis, nothing. Just appealing to the worst possible sensibilities of people and making them think that their neighbor is their enemy. Oddly enough, you know, what I find is it's hard for me to parse in some ways about the fundamentalism aspect of this because I'm not a religious believer anymore myself. But so often the, the key to trying to talk to people to whom you feel like you've reached this impasse is to resort to something like a religious appeal. Because most of the people that I know who take up these, frankly, cruel positions are people who consider themselves to be believers, and specifically Christian believers, and to take the Bible seriously. And so sometimes I just try to move around the, the Constitution altogether and just get back to saying, okay, what does it mean, this idea of the golden rule? What does it mean to say that you have this entire New Testament written about how we need to be forgiving and non-judgmental and take in the sick and the poor? What does any of that mean? And sometimes that actually opens up a space. But for the classroom, the day after the 2016 election results were announced, I've never experienced anything quite like what was happening on campus that day. I had to teach the next day, and it was so incredibly quiet. And I had a criminal law class, and we had a certain topic that we should have covered. And I got to the room, and I looked out at my students, and many of them were weeping in class. And I realized I can't have a normal class. Like this is not a day where we can have, we can pretend as though the world hasn't changed in some sort of truly, truly significant way. And I said, you know, what we're going to do instead is we're going to talk about all the things that this election means to you right now. Just the things, the questions you want to ask, because there's so many legal questions, the kinds of fears you have, the concerns you might have. Let's just talk about them. And we did, and I just let the conversation go wherever it wanted to go. And what was heartbreaking about it was that so many of the questions were, what will happen to the people I care about? Mm -hmm. What is going to happen to my relative who's here illegally? What's going to happen to my same-sex marriage? What's going to happen to you know all the people that I care about? And I was both at the same time so heartbroken for my students, but also so 
there was something incredibly beautiful about the fact that they were all worried about how are we going to take care of each other, given that this has happened. And that was the hardest moment I think I've ever had to try to say, what's the point? Because some of the questions towards the end were, what's the point of being a lawyer in a world like this when, when nothing matters, when the law doesn't matter? And I said, lawyers will be the only thing, possibly the only thing standing between us and chaos. You, as a lawyer, can do more for the world in that capacity to uphold the rule of law, to stick to a principle, to say we're not going to bend and sway because of popular prejudice. You will be the ones who are going to stand in the way of this chaos. And if you choose to do it, if you feel that you can do it, that's a gift that you will give the world that is incredibly valuable and incredibly precious. And that's the only thing I could think to say, which was true, you know, and I still do believe, but it becomes increasingly difficult to hang on to because when the rule of law itself becomes as undermined as it has been in the last couple of years, you can see law students having a crisis of conscience as well they should. And so it's very difficult every day, I think, to get up in front of my students and say, this is why it still matters what you're doing. This is why being a lawyer can still be a valuable and important contribution to the world. But I think it's testimony to your teaching to s still do it and to say, let's not give up, even in the face of this systematic undermining of the rule of law. Let's not give up. Because to give in and give up to this and to relinquish this moment, what else is there to do? If you were to say to your student, it's all lost already, that's giving up on the most vulnerable mm -hmm. right now who are already being targeted, harassed, et cetera. Yes. So in some ways, I think to say to students, yes, it's really, really difficult, and there's probably not a lot of inspiration every morning from the news, but it's maybe all the more important to then rethink these principles and remind ourselves what our principles are. I think it is, and this is why I feel so incredibly grateful to have the job that I do, not just as a teacher, which I have always wanted to be, but to teach law in particular, in particular at this moment in history. It's not because I think that law is the greatest discipline or that the highest calling is to be a lawyer. I, I don't think that. But what I think is the components of what a good legal education really are, I think are exactly what good citizens should be following, which is the idea that you need to learn what a principle is, you need to learn how it applies in different situations, to test your own limitations about the outer boundaries of what you would do to apply that principle. And if you encounter a conflict, you can't run away from it. You either, you have to change your principle or you have to distinguish the case in front of you. That I do actually believe is the way that we should be as ethical human beings, not just as lawyers. You cannot take any principle, whatever it is, and simply say, I'm going to apply that to myself, but to this person across the room from me whom I don't like, they don't get it. You can't say that. That is not a legitimate argument to make in a law school classroom, and it shouldn't be a legitimate argument to make anywhere. So I actually think that training and that habit, because as Aristotle says, it's all habits, right? Learning those habits mm -hmm. in law school, wherever it is that one learns them, those are incredibly valuable and will keep us human, I think. I want to thank you for writing such a lucid book, and it's very clear, and I've, I'm not a lawyer, as you know, and, but I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of <laughs> constitutional lawyers on Free Speech Island. Yes. You have achieved something to write a very, very clear text on these principles that should guide us in the law and where the law has been used to actually do what wasn't intended, which is to create conditions that are equal for everybody. And it's, I think, a really great contribution to also open up this discourse to people who frequently don't have a chance to be in a law school or to mm -hmm. talk with constitutional lawyers and are just being told you don't understand this amendment or you don't get it or you don't really know. And we are the experts mm -hmm. behind our you know, gates and, <laughs> or in our robes and we decide for you. And your book, I think, does a work to say, this is a very readable book, and it's not that long. People can actually read it and say, I need to rethink because I'm being told something that doesn't work really very well. And the contradictions in the system are very apparent, but it takes the work of a book for a more popular audience. It's a very readable book for non-academics, which I think is a really great contribution. I really appreciate that. I don't think there's any better compliment that I could get because that is really what it is that I wanted to achieve with this project, that I don't like the idea of knowledge being locked away, accessible only to a certain few, not just because of the financial cost of having a legal education, but also, I mean, the law is going to touch all of us and the promise of it and the limitations of it are going to affect everyone's life. And I am very anxious about the fact that so much of that legal knowledge is kept away from people and that it is made inaccessible in so many ways. And so very much the project of this book was to try to make it accessible. So I, 
I deeply appreciate what, what you're telling me about that. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for being on the podcast. And I'll try to do my part to use the internet as a constructive medium. (laughs) (laughs) Which is wonderful. Thank you for that. (laughs) Yeah. And I'll do my best to get the book to the listeners. And hopefully we'll have another opportunity to talk at some point. I hope so. This has been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for this conversation. Yeah, this is my inspiring summer reading. So I'm happy (laughs) happy you gave us this book. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for being on the show. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye.